Let's go for a drive. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Just Off the Highway. So today, I'm going to tell you the story of the shooting of an innocent man. Technically, in full view of tens of thousands of witnesses, and yet no one saw who actually fired the shot. And I'm going to share the story of some extraordinary police work that managed to pick the shooter out of hundreds of thousands of suspects, spread right across kilometers of the city of Johannesburg. Now, if you're not yet a member, this episode has been gifted to you by our small group of generous supporters and members. Please, consider paying it forward. Make one easy click on buymeacoffee.com slash lprogers. And uh, if you leave me just the price of your favorite iced skinny hazelnut macchiato, I can produce a lot more of this public content and your regular bonus episodes at a much faster rate. So let's go to the scene. Emirates Airline Park in Johannesburg. But in 1989, at the time of the crime, it was known as Ellis Park Rugby Stadium. At about 10 to 7 on the 18th of April in 1989, a match was being played, and a spectator by the name of Johan Duplessis was sitting in the stands watching the game. And he was sitting in row A, seat 244, on the east side of the stadium. Suddenly he took a massive wallop in the chest and there's blood and he's in pain and it, he realizes he hasn't just been hit by some sort of casual Nazi thrown by a opposing supporter. He's been shot, but he's been wounded. How? Why? What was the motive? And where was his attacker? But these questions had to wait uh, until later because of course Mr. Duplessis had to be rushed to hospital. He underwent emergency surgery, and he survived. He was very lucky. Okay, not that lucky. I mean, if he was really lucky, then the bullet would have fetched up in the seat next to him. But he was lucky enough for a man who was unlucky enough to be randomly shot. As I said, this was 1989. And in those days, the police liked the challenge. So they set about trying to solve this crime. And they examined the bullet that they removed from his chest and they deduced that it was either a 38 Special or a 357 Magnum that had been fired by a handgun. And judging from the wound, the bullet had traveled the maximum range, more or less uh, a kilometer. So it had come from outside the stadium. So Mr. Duplessis, he was able to tell the police which way he'd been facing when he was hit. So the forensics and the ballistics combined and they were able to estimate the trajectory of the route. And slowly the possibilities were narrowed down. Think CSI Duenfontein. But even the narrowed down area was more than two kilometers wide and included this, the most densely populated area of Johannesburg, the high-rise apartment blocks of Kilbrow and Berea, and moving on to the rather crowded little suburb of Yeovil. They began to question people door to door about who had heard gunshots more or less at the time of the match. Now this is the only part of the story that I struggle with. Not that the cops would painstakingly set about interviewing thousands of people, that I can believe. But even when I moved into this part of the city some months later after the incident, and I lived and worked in this area through most of the 90s, gunshots were not that unusual, and not even the weirdest sound that you would hear in an evening. Not by a long shot. So eventually the questions led them to a block of flats named Madison Square, here in Hillbrow. Okay, so this area of Madison Square is the only place that still bears this name, so I'm guessing that this is the actual building. Uh, a lot of people believe that the bullet was actually fired from Ponty Tower. So I'm struggling to figure out what is the real fact and what has become an urban legend. When they asked, somebody had indeed heard a shot at about the right time. And police investigated, eliminating possibilities until two men were arrested. Uh, one of them actually confessed to firing the shot. Case closed, the crime solved. 
Now, the weird thing is I wasn't able to find the name of the bear. Public information is surprisingly difficult to come by about this whole incident. But it was only 34 years ago. Perhaps one of them, or all of them, is still alive, maybe even still living in Johannesburg. Can you imagine if one of them is watching this video and, and makes contact? But, hey, the chances of that would be small, infinitesimally small. Pretty much like the chances of being hit in the chest by a stray bullet when you're watching a rugby game. Thank you for all of your support, your encouragement, helping me grow just off the highway and preserve these incredible South African stories. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video with all your friends who like a different story. Cheers.